Good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Today marks one month since Hamas terrorists in invaded Israel and butchered more than 1,400 people. Now, October the 7th is destined to become a date we never forget. Like 9-11, its morbid memories will echo through history. But as Israelis today look back in anger and in grief, the rest of the world is beginning to contemplate what else that date will come to represent. Will it plunge the Middle East into a deadly, wider crisis? Will the simmering racial resentment cause bitterness and bloodshed across the world? Will it nail the coffin of a two-state solution? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has given his first answer to the big question of what happens to Gaza when the war is over. And frankly, it's a major cause of concern. Israel will, for uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility. This means Netanyahu plans to effectively occupy Gaza completely for an indefinite period, long after the bombing and bloodshed is done. That, to me, is a massive error of judgment. Hamas says more than 10,000 Palestinians are already dead since October the 7th. That's 10,000 grieving families who will blame Israel and Netanyahu for destroying their lives. And as the bombing intensifies, their fury and malice will surely spread. There will be no safe or fair way for the Palestinian people to live under an Israeli heel. No path to peace. Netanyahu must surely know this. Last night, I asked the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, if Netanyahu himself is now a barrier to peace. He gave a diplomatic answer that was, I would say, far from a ringing endorsement. The day after the war will come where all these issues will be discussed. We are a vibrant democracy. We don't shy away from anything. But right now, we're all united. We're all united in one goal. We must return the hostages back. We must overcome and prevail against our enemies. And we must bring peace and security to our borders and our peoples. This is my only aim at this point. And I get it. Israel's focused on wiping out Hamas after what they did to their people on October the 7th. But what happens next will change the course of history. Palestinians need new leaders who accept a Jewish state. Israel needs a new leader who recognises that Palestinians too deserve a state and the same human rights as Israelis. Netanyahu has honestly divided to rule. He propped up Hamas to split the Palestinians with now catastrophic consequences. Now he's making incendiary calls for more lengthy occupation when tensions couldn't be higher. I don't know, frankly, who should control Gaza when Hamas, or if Hamas, is wiped out. But I do know it can't be Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, my first guest tonight was a guest of Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel early this year, when he was fated as the most prominent Iranian to visit Israel in history. The exiled crown prince of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, joins me now from Washington, D.C. Uh, great to see you, uh, Crown Prince. I, I really appreciate you joining the program. I've interviewed you several times Good over evening, the years Pierce. in different circumstances. So it's great yes. to have you on Uncensored for the first time. First of all, your reaction... Well, uh, good. I'm sorry. Sorry. Good to talk to you again, Pierce, after about 12 years, I think, last time we spoke. So, it is. Uh, when I'm I was glad at CNN. You me on your program. It is. It's yeah. good to see you. Um, yes, let right. me ask you, first of all, you. your reaction. We're a month in now to the... Israel-Hamas war. What is your reaction to what has been going on? Pierce, I think that the world cannot ignore the elephant in the room, and that is since the rise of uh, radical Islam as a result of the Iranian revolution that took my country hostage to begin with, and has since fomented this kind of uh, antagonism, regional instability, warmongering, uh, supporting terrorist groups, and what have you, we should not really be surprised that at the tail end we are faced with this kind of uh, ri rises in tension. And I think it's, uh, it's telling that, you know, we have to cure the disease ultimately, and uh, until and we don't put an end at the ideology itself, I don't think we can really be hopeful to have a legitimate peace in the region for the best interest of the people living there and, of course, beyond our region, how it impacts the rest of the world. Yesterday, I interviewed the President of Israel, Isaac Herzog. I know you met him as well as Prime Minister Netanyahu on your historic visit to Israel. And he said this about Iran. There's an empire of evil from Tehran emanating with a whole culture of hate to eradicate all of us. 
Would you agree with that? Look, I think uh, President Herzog, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I think along with that, many leaders and beyond leaders, people in the world who by now have hosted in their respective countries, in the West and elsewhere, Iranians who were forced to flee the country as a result of this regime, to understand that what the Iranian people are like and want is totally different than, uh, than the regime in Tehran. And I've always asked for uh, uh, the world community, including media, when they talk about Iran, to specify that they are talking about the regime in Iran, not the people of Iran. So when we say Iran, I want to make clear that this is not the Iranian people you're talking about, but the regime. That's mm -hmm. very important as a distinction, because I think that while the problem correctly emanates from Tehran, and I've been saying this all these years, that the eye of the octopus is, in fact, in Tehran, and we are busy fighting the tentacles without putting out the beast itself. Of course, uh, in that statement, I think he's correct. The question, however, is how can this change come about? And there's a lot to discuss about this matter. Well, there is. And of course, central to this right now is the war against Hamas, a terror group who've been in charge of Gaza for 17 years or so, um, really ran a repressive regime of their own against their own their own people, continue to treat Palestinian civilians as just some kind of uh, military capital that can be expended on a whim, it seems. Um, and everyone who saw what happened on October the 7th, who has an ounce of humanity, will completely understand why Israel is going so hard now for Hamas. But the problem for the wider world, and certainly for the wider Arab community, is that in trying to eradicate Hamas, who, who live amongst civilians, there are thousands and thousands of completely innocent, often children, half of the casualties are reported to be children, being killed in the process. Uh, is there a moral equivalence here? Is there a line that Israel shouldn't cross? Or is this idea that they should be proportionate just for the birds if you're in a war and you're trying to wipe out a terror group? Well, again, the, the principal funding and the principal support that comes to these groups must have a money trail and a source uh, in terms of uh, what's keeping them uh, going. Uh, it's not a secret that the regime in Tehran has been behind most of these groups, has financed them, has armed them, has used them as proxies to advance their agenda in the region with the ultimate goal of exporting an ideology and force the world into assimilation under a modern-day caliphate. This is not simply in the region, Pierce, mind you. Today we hear this ominous sound of uh, radical Islamists who are trying to shape a different future for countries even in Europe, hoping to gain a majority and force uh, uh, the laws to change uh, in the way they want to see the, the, the world govern under this kind of uh, caliphate. This is really a challenge that faces all of us. It's not just an issue to Israel having to deal with the problem of having been attacked by a terrorist group. It is the nature of the beast itself. As I said, it's a disease that needs to be cured. And while you can deal with the symptoms, if the cure is not found, and in my opinion, the cure is to put an end to what is the source behind this extremism, this radicalism. The problem will never uh, uh, dissipate. One has to do what they have to do, sometimes wrong, sometimes it's a moral issue, as you pointed, but that doesn't solve the ultimate problem. I believe that the sooner we solve the root cause of the problem, all of these issues will ultimately find a way to find the proper resolution with every uh, interest of uh, humanitarian, and uh, liberties of all people, Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, uh, Iranians, and the whole world. We have to work together with the problem and not, you know, uh, uh, kick the can down the road and, and hope that by miracle the problem is going to dissipate. It's not going to. Do you have any doubt that Iran was behind what happened on October the 7th in terms of the scale of it, in terms of the quantity of, of uh, you know, firepower that they... Uh, took over the border. I mean, do, does it look to you like an Iran-sponsored operation? Well, I think that uh, hours after the attack, there were already some Palestinian banner that were hanging uh, on some public buildings in Tehran, and a short visit thereafter 
uh, of uh, Iran's officials uh, with uh, Hamas representatives. This simply is not a coincidence. It must have been in some form or shape planned or anticipated. And in fact, they haven't denied the fact Hamas itself has had thanked officially one of their uh, representatives. I saw a clip somewhere where he actually acknowledges the support coming from uh, Tehran. So uh, they're not denying it. And, uh, and I think that's a fact that is uh, hardly contested by anyone who understands enough about uh, the quagmire uh, in the Middle East and, and Iran having been the godfather of terrorism all these years. Final question. We've seen ISIS pretty well wiped out. We've seen al-Qaeda severely diminished in its ability to operate. If Israel was to be successful in eradicating Hamas, uh, and affected regime change in Gaza. Could you see this spilling over, potentially, to regime change in Iran? And if it did, would you be keen to go back there and assume the power that was removed from you in 1979? Well, Pierce, my formula for change in Iran is, of course, based on popular sovereignty and the free will of the Iranian people that can only choose their future once liberated from this regime that denies them the right to freely choose or elect whoever they want in the future. My process for change in Iran is to make sure that we have a democratic transition post-regime collapse, that we can have a constituent assembly when people's representatives will debate what will be the best course for the country in the future, to offer the Iranian people by referendum a chance to ratify the proposed constitution, hopefully based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which are clear, uh, you know, separation of church from state. And it is for the Iranian people to ultimately voice their choice. I'm not running for any office or have any, any other uh, ambition in mind other than to serve that process and be a facilitator for that process and speak on behalf of all Iranians for their right to choose and freely determine their, their future. I do, however, believe that the solution in Iran is regime change, and this regime will never change its behavior, which is why in 40 years of trying, the, 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 the biggest problem and flaw in Western policy, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, was an expectation of behavior change. This regime's DNA doesn't go along with the values that Iranians cherish, that is also cherished in free countries, human rights, equality, putting an end to any form of discrimination. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that people in the world, if they truly want to help the process of stability and, and democracy and freedom, to be on the side of the Iranian people and forget about continuing to negotiate with a regime that has never had any intentions to reform itself. The time has come for change at the ask of the Iranian people. And therefore, I think the world has a golden opportunity to use the best allies they have in the process as the instrument of change, the Iranian people themselves. But they cannot fight alone. We need to have support from the uh, coalition of the willing in free societies and people who do uh, champion democracy and human rights. But one word answer, if you got the opportunity democratically, would you go back and lead Iran? I will help. Uh, my fellow competitors as much as I can with no personal ambition. I, I don't think that uh, uh, the issue for me is anything beyond helping the creation of the kind of institutions okay. well, well beyond the constitution and government because civil society is the ultimate watchdog for society and we need to, to strengthen this institution to make democracy a lasting system in the country. Okay, I'll take that as a yes, not 76 words, Reza. <laughs> no, I, I will. I will help in any way that I can, of course, if the opportunity presents itself. It's good to talk to you again. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Reza Halavi, thank you very much. Thank you, Piers.